So, on Tuesday, we started talking pure competition. We're talking farmers here. And I, you know, I, well, I use the example farmers, but it's anybody's making something that a whole bunch of people are making the exact same thing. Coal mines, the coal you're digging up is the same as coal somebody else is digging up. Oil to a certain extent. Other commodities like copper, or something like copper and iron and that kind of stuff. It, no. it is. Hmm? Oh. Phones, no. Phones are different. There is a, this is, this one here is significantly better than any iPhone that's ever been made. I'm just saying, I mean, it's on your phone. But is it? It depends on the ass. No, because my phone gives me freedom. My phone lets me do things and set up things where an iPhone just, just sticks you in this narrow little box and that's all you can do with it. So, a phone is not a phone. A smartphone is different. It's a better phone scale. It won't make all text. Do the basic stuff like any other phone does. No, my own phone does text. Talk about it. <laughs> Cell phones. Actually, it's my home phone does text. Thank you very much. What? Yes. Oh, there's, okay, there's two ways you can do this. Do this. Okay, so here's what I we did. Because we got cheap somewhere along that track. Uh, yeah, you get your phone plan, uh, you, you just to have a home phone line, it's like, what, $30, $35, something ridiculous like that. Just to have a phone there. Well, you can get one of the little fun plans, whatever, like ten dollars a month or that kind of thing. Thing. So you get that, and you can get a Bluetooth adapter box that goes for about I don't know forty, fifty dollars. That you plug in the phone. You plug in a phone jack to it. So what we so what we have is this little box. The cell phone is paired to this box with Bluetooth, and it makes all the phones in the house. Work like speakerphone or like Bluetooth headset thing, thing, thing for whatever. So I mean, you know, we've got one of them cordless telephone systems. It's like four phones for one base station kind of thing. It's plugged into the back of this box. So we're anywhere in the house. We're dialing just like you. Instead of the wire coming from our terrible phone company, the wires put connected to the box and Bluetooth connected to your cell phone. So boom, there we go. And I've got an old phone. Just there we go. Next slide. No, uh, next to 5X, actually. Um, and I'm actually doing it through Project 5, so. Uh, and you can actually do it with Google Voice and actually make a box while well, you can't do the texting. But I mean, I'm like, I've got a cell phone link there, so you can actually send or receive texts too. So I can get somebody with the, our home phone number that can send a text. But I want somebody to text me with another key text. But anyway. Um, Yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a bit of a hacker. The other thing, some of y'all y'all come by my office carry saw so yesterday. I now have an announcement sign or something. This scrolls to announce every 10 seconds hanging outside my office. Um, I built it myself, even flipped over parts. I mean, it's just it's a monitor mounted in the back of a bookcase. I have a little computer thing thing hooked up to it. I'm actually setting up another one with a Raspberry Pi computer that I'm putting in the Anyway, so first. So that's five minutes of your life. You'll never do that. Okay. Um, farmers, or even you know anybody just making any kind of commodity. What the, the coal you digging up is the same as coal I'm digging up. The oil you pumping is the same as the oil I'm pumping, based on the way it is graded out. Because oil, you got different flavors of oil, but it's only like three or four categories. And it's what kind of oil you making? That's what it is. How pure is your copper? That's what it is. How what's the moisture content of your soybeans? That's what it grades out to. And then everybody that's graded the same, it's, it's the same, it's treated the same, the price is the same. So ultimately, we got to talking uh, about that. Since you're one of many producers, you don't have any power, any control over changing your product. You don't have any power or control over your price. Because if they don't like the price you're trying to sell, they can just tell you to get out of the way because there's a bunch of other people they can buy from. Um, this is like the, the, the best looking girl in high school. She's got her pick of dudes, right? So if anybody, if some dude comes up there and starts laying the line she don't like, she can tell him to take a hike, right? Because she's got other options. But somebody that doesn't have as many options might end up finding themselves having to compromise or that kind of thing. 
right? But if you supermodel and you don't have your counterman, like we need my wife to counterman, she didn't have to do this. Supermodel. Okay. Anyway, uh, so, um, so we got to talking about the concept, and I can't remember if it's on the slide or less. Uh, ultimately, the only choice that the producer has in a pure competition situation is how much am I going to produce? And we looked at this slide the other day, and we identified the break-even point. That's the amount that they have to produce to pay for all of their fixed costs as well as all the variable costs that break even and we calculated on the last test last week, um, two weeks ago, whenever that was. But if they go beyond the break even, they start to make profit and they keep going and they can make more profit and more profit, but if they keep going, the profit can start shrinking. So somewhere along the line, there is the sweet spot, that perfect point. Now the Haley showed up. Thank you. Um, the, I'm 99%. Yes, I think. Yes. Um, you get to that perfect point. I hate Microsoft. Okay. Um, be rid of my scribble. Um, you have this point where the gap between your revenue and your cost is most. Static electricity. Um, and at that point, you're making the most profit possible, and that's what you want to do, right? Make the most profit possible. So ideally, the farmer is going to do the math, and they're going to figure out what their cost curve looks like. And then they're going to do their estimate on, well, what do I think the price of soybeans or corn or whatever it is that I'm growing? What do I think the price is going to be? And then I multiply it out to come up with that total revenue line. And then I can sit there and eyeball this do it very fast and sell spreadsheet and boom. So basically, the farmer really needs three things. They um, they need a total fixed cost that they can end up converting to an average fixed cost. Right? And they would need a um, their average variable cost or their marginal cost. So between these two numbers, that can help them to define that total cost curve. And then they need their uh, need the price, and then that'll help them to come up with that revenue curve. And you, you can do this very, very fast with an Excel spreadsheet once you have these numbers, but it might take you a while to figure out what are all of my fixed costs to add them up. Because farmers are doing this not for the month, but for the year. Because they get their payday once a year when they go to harvest, right? So that once a year, twice a year that they get paid has to cover all the expenses for the entire year. So they look at 60 bucks a month phone bill times 12 months, that's whatever, that's $720 a month a year. Well, yeah. How much am I paying for the truck for the year? How much am I paying for insurance for the year? How much am I paying for everything for the year? And then they've got to really keep up with the truck. The, make the best guess they can for the variable costs about how much fertilizer, how much do I spend on fertilizer, how much do I spend on water, how much do I spend on electricity, year after year after year, average that out to how much, does that work you know, per acre, working out for my yield, that kind of thing. So, if you can do this, you can do this, and you can say, boom, 300 is the number. Score. If I do less than 300, I won't make as much profit. If I do more than 300, I won't make as much profit. I'm going to aim for 300. But I know I need to do more than 165. And if you're really bored, you'll do that math and say, well, I know I need to do more than less than whatever that number is, 400, whatever. But you're never going to want to go beyond 300, right? Y'all cool with this? Wait, theoretically, are y'all cool with this? Y'all make sense like, dude, that's a tool layer, right? In reality, are y'all cool with this? There's some problems with this. 
which we kind of needed at, I think I mentioned it the other day, is that line based on the guess. What do I think in March that the price still remains is going to be in October? And that game changed wildly, it can change, change drastically based on things outside your control. How many farmers last spring planted three beans thinking that they were going to get around four or five dollars a bushel and they ended up getting you know, 250 bushel? Because of a trade war. Who knew? A whole lot of gifts. Maybe just maybe, well, if a drought hits half of the country but not the part of the country where you're at, well, there's going to be a shortage. So what's going to happen? Woo the price of story beans is higher. In which case, well, dang it, instead of 300, we should have been out there like 500 somewhere. So, yeah, we got a little profit, and we did a little bit better than expected, but we didn't make the most profit possible. So, the best you can do is make the best, most likely guess that you can make. So, what are the odds of sort of easy to be selling $5 a bushel? Where did the odds be selling for six? Where did the odds be selling for four? You can do some kind of weighted average calculation thing, thing, and go. Suddenly got a little bit more complicated. But then, your cost curve. I ain't nothing but a guess. Because maybe this year you plant. You know, three pounds worth of seeds, put down five pounds worth of fertilizer, and you got 20 bushels. Next year, you put the same amount of seeds and the same amount of fertilizer, and you only get three bushels. Why? Because maybe you're in one of the areas that had to grow, right? Or maybe you're in one of the areas that got flooded, or maybe you're in an area where the, your next door neighbor's using the Roundup and the, the dike or dike and what, and it's fogging over and it's drifting into your fields and killing your beans and that kind of thing. Look at that round up that can but it, it, it's it, there's lawsuits galore about that as well. How was and then you know, it's just the conversion of you, know, you don't get you don't get the same number of soybeans per acre each year. You don't get the same number of corn per acre each year. Even though maybe you try, you hope, but it doesn't happen because it's weather is a thing. You know, the effectiveness of your soybeans, that kind of stuff. How, what, what was the condition of the ground? Well, last year the ground like, still had a bunch of minerals in it, and then we put more fertilizer in it, and boom, but then it just all of it got leached out. And so this year the ground is basically like the desert, and then you put some stuff in there, and the ground still isn't anywhere near as good. Maybe warm, warm days, cold days, electricity change. What, the cost of the electricity changes is different than anything. The cost of your gasoline is different than anything. You spend more day. The tractor's broken down more days this year than it was last year, so you spend more money on repair bills this year than last year to get the same amount of vapor. You just don't know. So, these curves ain't nothing but guesses. Theoretically, if you knew those numbers, bammo is perfect. It's perfection. 300 is it. But you don't know. And of course, the nightmare scenario is crap. Our costs get higher, and boom, uh, the price of our product gets lower, and ain't nowhere on there that you're making any money. Does it happen? As soybean farmers last year. So. This is a good mental exercise to have to know and know that this is the target that the farmer should be shooting for. But the farmer, theoretically, there's this perfect number, but they don't really know what it is. Because the best you can do is look at your average, and get a guess on your average variable. You can figure out your total fixed costs and fits, correct? Right? But to come up with your variable costs, well, they vary year after year after year, not only based on your production, but based on other stuff. So you kind of look, look at your historical average over the last two, three, five, ten, twenty 10, 20 years. And then you got to adjust it for inflation every year. And that kind of suddenly, you're not talking farming, you're talking accounting. Uh, 
they, they do in certain areas, certain parts of the world, but it's very, very, very hard to do. It's very hard to get stuff because it's so, so, so many parts. And then you have to get them all to sign on, get all over to a And a lot of them, part of the reason why they're going into farming is because they're independent anyway. It's the last thing you want to do is give up that independence. Going to union and have yet somebody else knowing what to do. So, um, so that's a good question. Maybe forget that last point to know about the name. It's all essential. Whatever it is that I'm going to ask you about the best that we didn't want. So, as we, this one should be obvious. Never produce something that's going to cost you more than it's going to bring in. Your goal is to maximize profit, not maximize income. And that's why we, you know, what we just saw. You don't want, you don't necessarily want to plant every acre you have because maybe it don't work out that way. You're not in it to make the most sales, you're in it to get that biggest gap between the revenue and cost. So here's the way to think of you. These are interchangeable. Marginal revenue. Marginal means what? Extra. Revenue means what? Income. So extra income. What is your extra income from doing something? Well, that's the price you charge, right? Okay, so I'm renaming the word price. I want you to be thinking of it as marginal revenue. Every extra bushel that you take to the market, you get an extra three dollars for it. That's the price that they're paying you for. So do I have another thing slide? Okay, I do. Oh. I hope that this microphone isn't loud. It isn't sensitive enough to hear me muttering underneath my breath and things that I say about the microphone. But it's anyway. So, marginal revenue is our price. What is that? That's change in our income divided by a change in sales. So, remember the second week of class. We talk about marginal cost, marginal benefit. What are the extra benefits of having a second car or a third car versus what are the extra costs of having a second car or a third car? Can you decide if the benefits of having two cars instead of one? Does that outweigh the costs of having two cars instead of one? If so, you get a second car. If not, you don't. What is the benefits of studying one extra hour for the test? What is the cost for studying one extra hour of the test? And if the benefit outweighs the cost, you're going to study that extra hour. You should. But if the benefits don't outweigh the costs, then you close the book and you go and do whatever it is that you're going to do instead of studying. Right. So in this case, same thing. If your extra cost can produce an extra bushel of soybeans, your extra cost to bake and sell an extra cake, the extra cost to assess meat and chicken is higher than the money they're going to pay you for it, you don't do it. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, Sam's cost per, per mile for driving his car, doing his Uber deliveries, maybe like 30 cents a mile, we'll go with that number. At 30 cents a mile, if it's going to cost him 30 cents a mile to do delivery, but the customer's only willing to pay him 25, Sam stays home. If they're willing to pay him 35, he's making money. All right. The same deals that I was doing trading money with Josie in class Tuesday. You know, I was giving her a dollar, she was giving me a quarter. She was good with that. But even when I got to the I was giving her a dollar, she was giving me 99 cents. She was good with that, right? She's only making an extra penny off of me, but she was making a penny. Her marginal cost, her extra cost of 99 cents was less than the extra benefit of a dollar, so she did that. So when did she stop? When I was offering her a dollar for a dollar. She said, why bother? Why risk getting a paper cut exchanging these things, right? That's exactly what you're thinking, right? Paper cuts, yes. So, based on that, here's your rule for a farmer. Here's your rule for everybody, not just farmers, but you monopolies, oligopolies, duopolies, they all make the same decision because they all have the same goal of making the most profit possible. 
So the profit maximizing rule, how much do we need to produce, all comes down to this. If the price is greater than our cost, we're going to keep going. If I can make more by baking another cake, then it's going to cost me to bake it. I'll bake another cake. And then once I bake that one, I'm going to ask this question again. And then I'll bake that one. And I'll ask the question again. If the price that they're going to pay is less than my extra cost to bake that extra cake, what am I going to, I'm not going to bake it. And ideally, what am I going to do? I'm going to figure out how can I slow down. I'm not going to bake as many cakes tomorrow, right? That's kind of hard to you if you've already baked it, baked it, you know, you've had a host. So ultimately, when your price is equal, to your marginal cost. And that's where you get to. If you can get more of it, if the price is higher, you increase production. If the price is lower, you slow down production. If they're equal, that's the that's that sweet spot. Where your price is equal to your marginal cost. So that number there tells you when to stop. That is that perfect point. But maybe the farmer doesn't know what their total cost curve is or average variable cost and to do all that stuff and that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, for the farmer, you know, they got to start planning six months in advance. But if you're an oil company drilling oil out of the ground, they just make the decision in the morning are we going to go out there and pump? Based on what have I got to pay my workers out there, how much electricity do I have to use, and how much work is it, what does it going to cost me? The price of oil went down last night, we're taking a break. The price of oil went up, all right, everybody get out there, we're going to work overtime. They can make the decision, turn it on and turn it off on a daily basis. Farmers, not so much. So everybody has that profit maximizing point. They keep going until the price equals their marginal cost. Then they stop. A dollar for a quarter, she did it. A dollar for 50 cents, she did it. A dollar for 75 cents, she did it. A dollar for 99 cents, she did it. Once it was a dollar for a dollar, Okay, we're stopping at five. Um, remember when we were eating, what, drinking soda and eating the pizza, doing the utility back a month ago? You know, that first orange gave you a lot of joy. You ate it. The second orange gave you a little bit of joy. You ate it. The third one, you a little bit of something. You ate it. The fourth one did nothing for you. You stopped. But stopping there, that you ate the perfect amount of oranges, it gave you the most joy from oranges you could get out of the day. Right? Exact same thing. So, congratulations, you just got rewarded for being here fifth week of class. You came back. So, for you visual learners, marginal revenue be flat, $3 bushel or whatever. Your marginal cost, I don't know if you remember this from last chapter, you know, it goes down. You know, remember that you, you bought a dozen eggs, you bought a bag of sugar, so the first cake was really expensive, but then second cake is pretty cheap to make, and the third one. And then the fourth one, they started getting more expensive. And then you start running the oven that much more. You start using the second mixer, the third mixer. You've got extra workers. You start paying more overtime and all that kind of stuff. You keep making cakes until you get to that cake that the $3 that they're going to pay you is saying is going to, it's going to cost you $3 to make. So you don't make any profit. I'm just going to keep on recycling these numbers. So it's better. That 300th cake. You broke even on. Cake 299, you made a profit. Cake 298, you made a profit. Cake 297, you made a profit on them. You make profit on them starting, what was that, 165? You start making your, you start, you're making profit, making profit, making profit, but it's a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. This is like the, the dollar for a quarter, dollar for 50 cents, dollar for 75 cents, dollar for 99 cents. Keep going visually. That's where you get to. So the other curve, we were looking at total fixed cost, total variable cost, total income. This is looking at it on a per cake basis, per bushel basis, per watermelon basis. But you end up where the, where the marginal cost and marginal revenue intersect, that is the spot where the total revenue and total cost is the widest away. Because you go beyond that. Start losing money per cake, 
starts chewing into that profit. If you do less than that, you're not making as much profit as you possibly could have been making. Um, I'm 98% sure I'm not going to ask for those graphs on the test. No, okay. Let me rephrase that. I am 98% sure I'm not going to ask for this one on the test. I am 92% sure that I'm going to ask, give you this. I'm going to ask you to tell me, okay, you're losing money here, you're gaining money there, and that gap in between is your profit max point. I can hear a lot of 92 pictures that one. So, you know. Congratulations, you just got rewarded for coming to class today. So, your profit, we've talked about before total revenue minus total cost. Or you can say, what's your price per cake? What's your average total cost per cake? Multiply by the quantity, you get the same answer. But if you sell it for five and it costs you for 50 to make, you made 50 cents per cake, right? Times how many cakes? 300. Okay, so that's $150. Whereas, okay, 300, three times, 300 times five, that's 1,500. Take away 459, then let's call 1515. You get the same number either way, right? Big numbers, little numbers. Okay. And 90% sure I'm not going to have you do that on the test, but this could show up as being a answer to one of the multiple choice questions. I don't know. I'm three weeks away from making this test. No, I Remember, your goal is about making the most profit possible. It ain't about being the biggest company in the world. It's about being the most profitable in your circumstances. It ain't about being the most efficient product company in the world. Uh, some companies, like I say, some farmers feel you, I'm just going to crank out as much as I can and see what happens. Forgetting the fact that as they get bigger, they might actually start getting efficient. Some people might say, well, I want to look at, I want to produce where my average total cost is the smallest. Where I'm at the most efficient point possible. What was the best trade that Josie and I did? Trading money the other day. Yeah, when I gave her a dollar, she only had to give me a quarter. That was the best deal she could have gotten. So she stopped there. How much profit did she make from me? 75 cents. But what did she do? She kept trading with me. Yes, she could make 75 cents on any other of the deals, but she got 75 the first time, 50 the second time, a quarter the third time, a dime the fourth time, and a penny the fifth time. That added up to, I don't know, a buck and a half. More than a dollar and a half. Which would you rather have, an extra dollar and a half or an extra 75 cents? And bragging right about how efficient you are. All right. You rather have had a buck 50. Because you can't spend the, I'm efficient. You know, that doesn't impress anybody. I'm telling you guys, if you're going out on a date and you're trying to impress a lady by saying, I need business, you feel like it. It ain't, it, it ain't happening. That's all I'm saying. Right? Am I right, lady? Yeah. It, 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 no, nobody's very impressed when you're bragging about how efficient you are. They are impressed when they see how fat your wallet is. Be unimpressed. For those of y'all following along at home, my wallet is. Maybe for each of the next pictures. And part of the reason why I said thick is that it's a smaller wallet, so my money's like folded over in quarters, so it's worth that. It's big. still ain't nothing in it. So, okay. So, um, just for illustration, say you visual learners, if you ain't visual learner, check out this. Is that dollar for a quarter point that I was talking about? There might have been, in reality, there might have been some other trades before we got to that point that weren't sufficient. There's some other trades after that that weren't sufficient. But this is going to be your most efficient point, but we ain't in it for efficiency. Because we're in it to get the most profit that we can. In case you don't believe me, let's have some numbers. 
Of course you believe me. But um, if we're trying to produce um, Okay, I don't. Okay, let's go with it. I'm having an issue with my labeling. This is my problem here. Okay, so they large on top of my drill. Anyway, don't worry about it. I, I really need to rebuild that slide, and I'm not going to rebuild it on the fly. Well, right here, but. Oh. <laughs> Here's your thing. You can take a loss. Here's the situation here. What happens when the price, you're losing money, but you're making more than enough money to cover your variable costs? Okay, that's how you go. I want y'all to have a flashback back here. This is visual graphical representation at that time, we were talking about when Sam is doing the deliveries and he's putting money into this bucket and he's made enough money to pay for the gas, and pay for the oil, and pay for the tires, but he hasn't made enough money to fill the second bucket to pay the car payment. All right? That's where we're at here. He's paid for all the gas, the oil, and the tires, all the variable costs, but unfortunately, he ain't making enough money to pay for all of those fixed costs, too. So what does he do there? That's a situation where he's like, He's mad, but he's sitting there hoping that things are going to get better, and if things are going to get better, well, he's going to ride it out because he's at least partially paying for the car payment. And he's hoping that things are going to get better in the future. That's that situation. Which you visually, you visual people, there you go. Oh, but here is a nightmare. They're only, it costs him 30 cents a mile to drive the car, and they are only paying him 20, so every mile he drives, he's losing 10 cents a mile, not even counting what he needs to cover his fixed costs, right? So what does he do there? Just stop the car, right? Just, you, you just stop driving, and you get out, and you leave the car at the side of the road, and you walk away. Got a car that's going to cost you more per mile than paying for it in terms of business. Okay, a couple more grains happening. Uh, for supply in the short term, there's some, some things you think about, some things you don't think about. Remember, we had those determinants of supply in chapter three, beginning of the semester. Yep. There's some of them that not so important in the short term. We start with ingredients. For the farmer, they're gonna ask, am I gonna be planting the soybeans or am I gonna go with corn this year? So they're gonna ask, well, what's the cost of the corn seed? What's the cost of the soybean seeds? What's the cost of the fertilizer that I need to use on each one of them? What's the cost of the water? What's the cost for any extra technologies that might be needed? What are my expectations for those costs in the future and incomes in the future? And can I get any help from the government? But what's not on here for the long-term things like the cost of the factor cost, land, labor, capital, and knowledge. If you be planting soybeans in about three weeks, you have time to go to college and major in agronomy and study everything you need to know in the next group. No. Do you have time to really go out and do your research and pick and find another tractor and go out and buy it? Probably not. Do you have time to go and say, dude, this is cool, and go out and buy it? You know, I think it's going to be great, and I'm going to go out and buy another farm and get a couple thousand more acres out of it. You don't. So for long-term things, don't have time for it. In a short time, short run, the decision that you're thinking, what am I going to do next month, is based on what you have now. And so it's only these four things that you're thinking about. What do I think is going to happen in the future? Is there any help I can get from the government? Is there any short-term technology? Otherwise, if a lot of this, eh, probably not, eh, probably not. So it's sort of the, what do I think is gonna happen and what's it gonna cost me in seed and fertilizer, the plant stuff. Just to keep with a soybean example, because soybeans took a bigger hit on this trade war thing than corn did. So if you're thinking, I could grow corn, I could grow soybeans. 
soybeans was ever last year. So what do you think the price of soybean seeds, that kind of stuff, is going to be this year? It's going to be cheap. Cheaper than corn. So it may be cheaper to plant corn, but you have the expectations of, do you think this trade war is going to be over by September? It might be cheaper to plant soybeans this year, but you might be thinking, I ain't going to be able to sell them. Yeah, I can make them cheap, but I can't sell them, so I ain't going to do it. All right. So you got to, you know, those are going to be the big two that you end up thinking about. The other two are going to factor in with the rest of that stuff on that list. Not too much. So, for instance, I've been waiting for this for a little bit. Remember the other graphs that I had? That one. We had 300, right? And we said you should be somewhere between 165 and, I don't know, 400. Are you ever going to want to produce more than 100 and uh, more than 300? No, because you're going to start losing money. So why would you work harder to make less money? So it's a whole lot easier to say, okay, we've gotten to this point, and we're stopping, right? So. Visually, we have the same thing here. Are you ever going to use an argument for example? Is you ever going to produce more than 300? No. Are you going to produce less than, what was that number, 165 or maybe? Are you going to do that? Yeah, I'm going to start farming knowing that I ain't going to produce enough to cover my costs. Can't going to do it. If the math says you got to get 165, if you can't do 165, you do something else, right? So nobody in their right mind is going to go into this game based on these numbers coming in at less than 165 or trying to go beyond 300. Would you agree? So, what's this? They're only going to be playing in this area that I just highlighted in blue. So let me relabel things a little bit. This is the supply curve for business. The March revenue line is the demand curve. Because Kellogg's is going to take everything that you bring, right? So that's that flat line. So in the supply curve, the farmers are only going to be operating, in this case, the farmers only going to be operating somewhere between 165 and 300. And where is the equilibrium point for them? The best point? 300. So the farmer should be looking at operating somewhere between 165 and 300. Ideally, 300. They, wouldn't eat, they shouldn't think about doing less than 165, and they shouldn't think about doing any more than 300. Are we there? I just wanted to share what my brain curves in and out. Now, we hinted at Uncle Sam and Aunt Virginia a couple minutes ago. We got to bring them in because they're going to complicate things. And th th this is going to apply not just for the farmers, but this is coming back to that profit maximization chapter blended together. Taxes. Some taxes are going to fit into your decision making, some taxes do not. Some taxes have a short term impact, some taxes do not have a short term impact. We have four kinds of taxes. This will be a question on the test. Name the four types of taxes. First one is property tax. Every acre of land that you buy or that you own, you got to pay taxes for it. The point of property tax, I can remember, who, did we talk about taxes at any of this last? Okay, the last budget. Uh, yeah, income tax, where they tax people that make money. But you have people that have money but aren't making it. So, like Bill Gates. You know, he's already made his money, but we'd still like to get money out of him, right? We, the government, would still like to get money from Bill Gates, right? Because he's still a drain on society. He's still driving on highways. We still want to get money from him. But if he ain't making any more income, we still want to get money. So we're going to tax the wealthy people. That's what property tax is part of. You tax people that have money, tax income. It's taxing people who are getting money. Wealth tax, uh, property tax is a form of a wealth tax. It's taxing people that have money, even though they're not bringing it in. But then the other thing is you may have people that you know, maybe they're not bringing it in, but they sure are spending it. 
So that's when sales tax comes in. Because you can have people that are doing a bunch of spending but not doing a bunch of income. You can have people that are getting a bunch of income but not doing a whole lot of spending. Or you can have people that don't have a bunch of income but they already have a bunch of money. This way you tax everybody, right? And everybody's pretty much going to get taxed at least two ways. And some of us, a lot of y'all, we get taxed all three ways. And if you got a car, and if you got a house, yeah, you do the car tax, the property tax, you pay property tax. Y'all pay sales tax when you go to the store? Yep. Yeah. Do y'all pay income taxes? Did y'all find how many of y'all did y'all income tax the last week here? Right? I did. You did? Any of the rest of you? Have any of you done any taxes yet? Besides Bobby? Two of you. The rest of you? I still haven't got my state tax. Y'all got a pretty good chance to get a refund, so you can crack it. I mean, you can get the software or whatever, and y'all are simple enough. You can, you probably can file for free on. They could, got, if your tax is simple enough, you can actually do the whole thing on free online. At least most people do, but unfortunately, I can. But so, property tax is a fixed cost. You got to pay tax on that land, whether you plant beans or not, whether you plant corn or not, whether you have cows or not. Property tax is a fixed cost. So since it's a fixed cost, it is going to raise your total cost, which is going to eat into your total profit. So ultimately, it's going to increase your break even. It's that many more beans that you've got to plant. Before, that, many, excuse me, that many more beans you have to sell before you pay things up. Because not only do you pay the tractor payment, not only do you pay your house payment, not only do you pay your truck payment, you also got to pay property tax. That's just another one in the pile of money that just got to come out of the second bucket before you got everything covered. But it does not change your profit maximizing quantity. Because your marginal costs don't change. So visually, here's what happens. Here's all that happens. Your average total cost went higher. You still are producing. The best spot you have is still the 300. But guess what? You're making less profit when it does sell because you just cook your sharing. Not only you do your business instead of keeping the profit for yourself, you do a business you're sharing with Uncle Sam and Aunt Jane, right? But it's still, otherwise, business as usual. You're just sharing some of the leftover profit with them. So you break even changes, but your profit maximizing doesn't. Second is your payroll tax. This one begins with letter P, the first one begins with letter P, the third one begins with letter P, maybe they'll tell me. And then the fourth one begins with letter S. So we're at the property, payroll taxes, it's a variable cost. Payroll is what? Income for who? Workers. So this is how much we put on the business point of view, how much you're spending on workers. We talked about this in human resources last week. Okay, the week before. Um, businesses have to pay, can help your workers contribute to Social Security. For every hour that you know, the people working, the business, the company takes six and a half, six and a quarter percent out of your paycheck and sends it to the Social Security Administration. And then they take it, have to do another six and a quarter percent and send it from their part of things. So if you make making $10 an hour, Every hour that you're working, the government's taking 62 cents, 62 and a half cents, and going into the Social Security bucket, and the government company has to spend 62 and a half cents to go to the Social Security bucket. So the more hours you work, the more money the company's having to spend on your behalf at the Social Security Administration. Same thing for unemployment insurance. Same thing for workers' comp. The, so more hours that people are working, and the more you pay your workers, the more money you, the company has to send in. And that is what the payroll taxes are. The point of view of companies. Okay? So this is a variable cost. The more you work, the more they have to send in. So the more workers we hire, the more hours we have them working, then that's how much more money do we have to send to the government. So what does that do? That's going to raise our total cost, which gets you into our total profit. And it's chewing into our per unit profit, so our marginal cost is higher too. So every extra cake we bake, that's that much more money that we're, it's going to cost us to bake it, which could be chewing into the profit that we make for each cake we sell. 
So our break-even quantity is higher. Instead of 165, maybe we got to do 180 or 190 cakes in order to break even. It also reduces that profit maximizing level too. So instead of 300 being the perfect point, maybe now it's only 280. Because our marginal costs went up, visually speaking. Our, to our average total cost goes up, our marginal cost goes up. So instead of working somewhere between 165 and 300, now we are working somewhere between, I'm just making up numbers here, and that target you have to hit just got a lot smaller in order to make profit. Makes it harder on a company. When the government comes around and says, if, if one of the options for helping Social Security that's going away is if they increase how much they're going to take out of our paycheck to Social Security. But then what does that do? It makes it harder for businesses to break even to be able to stay in business in the first place and makes it harder for those that stay in business to make a profit because that area where they can make a profit gets smaller. And if it gets too small and too hard to hit, well, what's going to happen? There you go. Quit trying to hit it. If I was to give you a baseball and have you try to knock over Sam's water bottle on his desk, how many of you, based on where you're sitting right now, how many of you like chances? Okay. And you throw it two, three times, you one, two, three times until you get it, right? Now, if I set yeah, I have y'all standing right outside the building over here near the tray where my office used to be in, and I sent his water bottle all the way down in the parking lot, and I told you to knock it over. How many times do you throw it before you give up? Saying it ain't happening, right? The farther, the harder the target is to hit, the easier it is to give up. And what happens for people when the, the company says, "I can't hit this target, I'm quitting." All the workers are out of work and the government doesn't want to do that. So that's one of the reasons why they really have a pull the trigger on decreasing the amount of money they're going to take out of people's social security check. That is take out of our paychecks for social security in order to try to fix the social security problem that we will talk about in four weeks. But what would be the point of raising the amount you have to pay for social security with the age that there's like the expected age, the expected age to get social security keeps going up. It doesn't keep going up. That's the problem. I thought it had been going up. Yeah. Nope. Uh, the oh, 10 years ago or so, they adjusted it to where people born between 1955 and 1967, I think, is the window. Uh, it, the retirement age went from 65 and climbed up to 68. But and we're in the middle of that adjustment phase for those people that are getting to that age to be starting to retire. But guess what? Y'all's retirement age is the same as mine, and it's sixty, either sixty-eight or seventy. I can't remember that. But it ain't going up any higher than that. It, we're just in that little transition phase, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a month. But part of all of the life expectancy. Yeah, life expectancy is half, we expect half of the people to make it to this age. So back when they first did Social Security, the life expectancy was about 65. And when you collect Social Security, 65. So what were they thinking? Half of people wouldn't get a single check. And those that did get checks wouldn't be getting very long because healthcare went that great 100 years ago, right? But nowadays, with the life expectancy you say it's 72 for men, I didn't realize it got quite that low in this 80 for women. Average that out, 76, guess what? That means we're going to have at least half of the people going to be drawing Social Security for more than 10 years. And that's where the problem is. That's where the problem is. Instead of half getting, half getting nothing, now and another half getting it for, I don't know, 5, 10, maybe up to 15 years, that's it. Now, Everybody, you know, three quarters of the people are going to be getting it, and half of the people are going to be getting it for 10 or more years. So, we that we're too healthy, so what they really need to do is retirement age needs to be based on the life expectancy. 
because retirement is a privilege, not a right. But anyway, so, and since they ain't gonna do that, maybe I'll work until you're 80, what's gonna end up happening? And they're just going to shrink the size of the check. And it ain't that big in the first place, and we'll talk all about that in four weeks, so I'm going to move on. The third tax, P number three, profit. So you have property, payroll, and profit. Profit is the income tax that business makes. Y'all may not really, a business is only going to pay taxes if they make profit. If they don't make profit, they don't pay taxes. Because that money's getting taxed elsewhere. Because they, the reason they didn't make profit is when we took our money and we spent it buying fertilizer and paying our employees. Well, guess what? Your employees pay taxes, but part of their you know, taxes on our, on our paycheck, right? And the money that gets spent in the buying fertilizer, well, the fertilizer companies can take that in. You know, if they make profit on it, then that gets paid, and then what do you pay their workers? Like, get taxed. So it's all going to get taxed elsewhere. But for the company itself to be paying taxes, it is over and above. After we've made it, after we've boxed it, after we've sold it, after we've paid our bills, at the end of the year, we do the math, and at the end of the year, if we paid all our bills, and we still got money left over in his last bucket, then Uncle Sam and Aunt Virginia get to stick their hands in that bucket. But the only way they can stick their hands in that third bucket, the, the profit bucket, is you had to already done steps one and two. You had to make it, you had to sell it, you had to pay your bills, right? So what happens here? You break even quantity doesn't change, your profit maximum quantity doesn't change. The only thing that happens is your market costs don't change. The only thing that happens is you got less money to party with when the year is over. But your decisions on what to produce, how much to produce, none of that changes. Only way a profit tax is going to change you is it might impact your investment decision of am I going to buy a new tractor, am I going to buy a new truck, that kind of thing. Because the payoff, as far as how much extra profit are you going to get, it's going to be a little bit smaller. So it shrinks that payoff, but it, profit taxes don't impact your decision making on what to produce, how much you produce, and so on. Like I said right here, the profit doesn't change, just where the profit goes. Into the hands of Uncle Sam and Aunt Virginia. And the fourth one is sales tax. I, sales tax works the same way. When do you pay sales tax? When you buy stuff, it's already been made and already on store shelf, right? So Sundrop decides, well, we're going to sell it for 60 cents. The store decides we're going to mark it up to a dollar. So the decision making for the gas station is based on the dollar. The decision making for sun travel is based on 60 cents. But then what happens? You buy a dollar can of soda, and what do you do? You leave a dollar five on the counter, right? Because you paid that dollar for soda, and then you gave over that extra five cents for sales tax. So it's not a fixed or variable cost. It doesn't impact the marginal costs or anything like that, because it happens after the fact. So your decision making here again doesn't change. This is a Another after the fact thing. So visually speaking, oops, flat line, nothing changes. But I, I knew we added the slide last year. Here, but, uh, so you with me on those taxes, payroll, profit, property, sales. You can be as uh, uh, I will ask, name the four taxes, and then I'm probably going to ask which ones affect the break even, and I'm going to ask which ones affect the profit making by then. I just sort of asked you a question for the past. Uh, the market supply curve, as I suggested, is going to determine the price for all producers. How much corn, all the corn farmers in America produce is going to dictate the price that each corn farmer ends up facing. If a bunch of corn, if all the corn farmers crank out a whole bunch of corn, then that makes it easier for Kellogg's to say, get out of the way, I'm going to buy it from somebody else, because there's 
Corn as high as an elephant's sign. Is that that's the expression? Yeah. Uh, it's fixed corn everywhere. Every farmer's got a ton of it, so it's easier for them. Than it's easier for them to refuse somebody that's trying to charge a higher price. So when corn is abundant, because all farmers produce a bunch of corn, Kellogg's is going to say, well, we ain't going to pay as much. It's just like you get normally when supply is high, price is low. Or the price is going to end up dropping. So they, it gives them power. So if corn farmers don't produce as much corn, well, then there ain't as much corn out there, so then it's harder for Kellogg's to refuse somebody. It's just like what I say, the prettiest girl in school, she can tell people to hit the road. Somebody that is not too pretty, it's got to think twice on kicking people to the curb, right? I know that's probably not the best metaphor, but there it is. Where am I going? Is this the last slide? Okay. Okay. I forgot I had this turn. So investment decisions shift the market supply curve. So if farmers buy more tractors, what's going to happen? They're going to plant and harvest more food, right? If farmers buy more land, what are they going to do? Plant and harvest more food, which increases the supply of the corn, soybeans, chickens, whatever it is. So as they buy more tools and equipment, more supply is going to happen. Why are they going to buy the tools? Buy those tools and equipment. Because of expected profit. Why am I going to buy a second tractor? Because I think I can make more money using two tractors, make more profit using two tractors than I can with one. Why am I going to buy a second truck? Because I can make more profit using two trucks than one truck. So it's expected profit. So when you see in any industry, if you see the businesses in that industry are investing, they're buying controls, buying new equipment, buying more land, buying more buildings, that kind of stuff, trying to grow. Why? Because they think the future is looking good. So that's just kind of a hint for those of you who want to invest in the stock market. Look around and see where the bulldozers are digging and what it is that they're building. The reason why they're building what you're building is because people in that industry think the future looks good. So maybe they know something you don't. Maybe that's an industry you want to invest in. Caterpillar is one of those bellwether stocks that kind of lets you know what the future of the economy is. If Caterpillar stock is going down, it means companies aren't buying as many bulldozers and stuff, which means there ain't going to be as much construction work going on next year because people think two years from now the economy is going to be in the tank. So if you want to know where the economy is going, look at those stock construction stocks like Caterpillar equipment. Companies like Alco with this aluminum and that kind of stuff. They're not exciting companies, but they're kind of used pretty good hints as to what's happening. So that's just some stock advice. All none of you that have any money to invest. So I'm going to go. When a new company comes in, supply is going to shift to the right. More corn is going to be grown. More soybeans are going to be grown. More chickens are going to be assassinated. But what ends up happening? The profit for that industry. You and I discuss, we don't care how many people are making growing corn. We don't care how many people are assassinating chickens. We're just going, you know, if you want a chicken assassinated, you call it chicken hunter. If you want corn, you get corn, right? We don't know, we don't care, but the more producers that are out there, our domain has changed, but the more producers that are out there, supply shifts out, each producer's can end up selling to a smaller share of market. So the profit for each company gets lower. Okay. Alternate universe. Here we go. Make over a camera, right? This is like, yeah. Better remember what you want. Free store happens. Mecklenburg County, because of earthquakes, breaks off and floats out of the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So we are our own little thing. So we can only try to only do business with one another, right? Okay. So it's just us. Connors on the east side of the county, Wills on the west side of the county. What do we want to grow? Big food, uh, something. 
tomatoes. Tomatoes. Okay. So Will is growing tomatoes on the west side of the county. Connor is growing tomatoes on the east side of the county. Who are you going to buy tomatoes from? Whoever's the closest to you. Yeah. So half of you are going to be closer to Will, half of you are going to be closer to Connor, right? So Connor's going to be selling to half of you, Will is going to be selling to half of you. And guess what? Probably the price they're going to charge is going to be about the same. Because Connor doesn't want to charge the price too much higher than Will because if his price is too much higher than Will, so we all are going to be saying, well, it's worth it for me to drive a little bit more than halfway across the county if I can save money on my tomatoes, right? So the price is going to end up being about the same. Connor's selling half of the tomatoes, making half a profit. Will is selling half of the tomatoes, making half a profit. There we go. Jordan, are you okay with that? Of course he's not. He's like, no, I'm going to start to make a bunch of money and growing tomatoes. And he's like, um, is he seeing him ride, riding into fancy cars and all that kind of stuff because they got control over the tomato market and that kind of stuff? So he's going to be like, break me off a piece of that. Jordan's going to be like, they're making a bunch of money on that. Well, let me, right? He's right here in the middle of the county. Well, no, he's not in order to enter the county. So he's going to start growing tomatoes. And of course, he's going to lower his price a little bit because he, the, the track out. So what's going to end up happening? He's going to lower his price because he's got to get over whatever loyalty. Then who y'all going to buy from? Some of you are going to be going to Jordan because he's close. Some of y'all are going to be going to Jordan because maybe he's a little bit cheaper than everybody else. But then what's Will and Connor going to do? They're going to lower their price too, right? Until the, the price can end up evening out, and then what happened? Jordan is selling to a third of you, Connor is selling to a third of you, Will is selling to a third of you. And what happened there? The price got lower that each of them are getting for tomatoes, and the amount they're selling. And the amount they're selling is getting lower. So what happened to the Connor's profit? It got cut. Pretty significant. He was making half the profit to a third of the profit, and that share of profit he's getting is smaller because the price went down. So, Connor, what do you think? Hopefully, you, you pay attention. You don't have to sit in the home and be all on high and mighty on the tomato farmer. He's right around, and when he's getting wind that Jordan is out there trying to plant tomatoes, what are you going to do about it, Connor? Um, you know, just accidents do happen. Uh, is, yeah. It just, I don't know what it was. Just my truck just sort of slid off the road and went through the cornfield about five times. It must have been hatch bikes. And I don't know. I can't believe I run over every tomato plant you had, Jordan. And trying to get out of your field and stuck in the mud or whatever, I happen to like break the track. That happens on the road with his crop. So nobody's getting to yeah. But it was an accident. Are you going to be happy with Jordan? No. no, Will, are you going to be happy with George? No. Will, no one be happy. No one. <laughs> well, if Connor decides to do the retaliation thing, ain't nobody going to be happy. Because Connor's suddenly in jail, uh, <laughs> Jordan is dead, and Will suddenly has 100% of the tomato market. Prices go up, and half y'all have to drive all the way across the country. Nobody wins, right? So let's just yeah. say go to violence. Yeah. yeah, except for Will. Let's just say go to violence and bring peace and all that other cliches in the 80s. <laughs> uh, I can't remember what name. Uh, but even still, as a third person entering the uh, the market, really there's going to be only one person really happy in this whole market triangle that's going on because two people have to lower their prices and cut their profits, and one person just getting more what they had to give them. Exactly. Why is Jordan going to do this? I'm not making anything of it. Okay, because he's going to be making more money than he was making before. Opportunity costs. He's giving up doing something else in order to go when he's trying to steal a third of the tomato market. So, as Bobby's saying, he's going to zero at something, so he's okay with that. But there's a little something else going on here, and I can't remember if I got it on the next slide or the slide after. Visual end. This is what happens. Because Jordan went in, we've got more tomatoes to choose from. So, more tomatoes are getting grown and produced. And what, what does that cause? Price to be lower. What is your, there's other winners here. Yeah, uh, those of y'all that eat tomatoes. Because you don't have to drive this far to buy them, and you're buying them cheaper, right? It's $2.50 a pound instead of $3 a pound. Score. And you ain't got to drive this far. 
You're win-win. You're happy with this. You love the competition. Hungry will not so happy, but okay. Individually, this is what's happening to Connor and Will. They're I you back up and say. Individually, you know, that's your profit maximizing point. This is your break even. Because Jordan came to town, what ended up happening? This is a new profit maximizing point. Less and how much profit are they making for each one that you're selling? Less profit and a smaller window. Less profit and a smaller window. Not heavy with Jordan at all. So maybe you don't tear up his crops, but occasionally you can see his truck in a parking lot of the somewhere you can sort of lean a nail on the front side and back side. So whether he goes forward or back, there's out of parking space where those nails can be driven up into the tire and things happen. There's your right way to And then of course you can be miles away when he actually gets flat tire. So um Oh, okay, let me do this numerical example, then I'll see what I was going to say. Numerically, what happened? Just for the numbers, before, BJ, before Jordan, uh, they were selling for $3 a piece, and it cost them two and a quarter to, a piece to make it, and at that perfect 300 bushel piece, if they were to do that, their income would be 900 their cost would be 675 they were making $225 profit. Woo. But now, AJ, after Jordan, price dropped to 250 Their perfect number is only 240 bushels instead of 300 bushels. The cost still the same. Fertilizer costs didn't change. Labor costs didn't change. Price of water didn't change. Property tax didn't change. But their income is now 600 The cost, 540 because they're not playing as much. Profit went from 225 down to 60 just in this numerical example. And, and, and this ain't extreme here. We talk about, you know, company, a lot of companies are kind of on the edge. It don't take that big a hiccup for a company to go from making profit to not. So let me ask this question before y'all read this bottom point. Okay, we already talked about Good for customers, bad for the producer. But why, what's the other reason besides going from zero to making money? Why else would Jordan get into the game in the first place? Well, it'll make his life better, but he's also, he's a smart cookie. He's taking economics with a fantastic economics instructor. And then he came here and said, my class is dead. <laughs> okay, no. He took, and he knows, he knows, well, I see how rich they're getting. I want a piece of that. But then he's doing that, and he goes, well, I know if I get in there, well, I ain't going to be making the same amount of money they are because I'm only going to be stealing some of their customers. Right? So he's doing the math, and he's not, Connor and Will have been behaving as if the price is three dollars, but what is Jordan doing? He's figuring the price is going to be two fifty, and he's going to ask, "Can I produce efficiently enough that I can make a profit that I'm happy with at two fifty? So I just used the word there, efficient. He thinks he's going to be efficient enough that he can make enough profit to make himself happy if he gets in the game, knowing the price is going to come down. So he thinks he can do it better than at least one of the two people that's in there. What? Maybe hoping that if he gets more efficient and the price gets lower, maybe one of them will go out of business and then he's going to be even better off. So, here we so Jordan can produce for $2 a piece. Oh, no, he can do it for, yeah, he can do it for 2 bid. 2 bid. He can, well, the, the price drop is 2 bid. Jordan can do them um, for $2 a piece. So he's like, I can do them for 2 and I know the price could go to two fifty. I'm okay making 50 cents. Connor, he was doing it for two twenty five, and he was okay at two twenty five when the price is $3. He's making 75 cents, but now at two twenty five, when the price drops to two fifty, he's only making a quarter profit. But Will... You know, he's got that bad dirt on the western side of the county. 
right? Just this all play and that kind of stuff. So, unfortunately for him, it, Chris, maybe it cost him 275 to grow. And he was okay growing 275 when he could sell these things for $3 a piece. But once that price drops down to 250 what happened, what's happening? He's losing money. So what might end up happening? You know, less efficient producers might get forced out of business because a new, more efficient producer came into the game. So, but maybe, Jordan comes in, the other two were efficient enough that all three of them are making a little bit of profit, but not a whole lot. But maybe because Jordan comes in, the price gets low enough, Will, being so inefficient, gets run out of business. Will's angry. Will's unemployed. Will is probably going to be the one most likely to be going to the private lot of Will's So then what happens? Okay, well, we're back to only having two tomato farmers. So what's gonna, what do you think is going to happen? To, so what's happening there? Half of y'all to be buying from Jordan. Half of you to be buying from Connor. Connor's going to have the profit. Jordan's going to get half the profit. The price is going to go up. But guess what? It can't go back up to three dollars again because Jordan and Connor are smart because they know if the price of if tomatoes goes back up to three dollars a bushel, what's going to happen? Will's going to get back in the game again. Because Will was making profit at $3 a bushel before, so they got to make sure the price doesn't get so high that it's going to attract somebody else like Will to come along. So that's what competition ultimately is good, even if some businesses come in, some businesses come out. Generally, it's more efficient businesses come in, it's less efficient businesses go out, the price ends up low, and as I said at the beginning of the semester, if you are making serious profit doing what you're doing, keep it secret. Because Will and Connor were showing off, riding around in their fancy vehicles and living in their big houses and that kind of stuff, and they were showing off their money, and Jordan noticed and said, break me off a piece of that. So if you're making profit, you got to keep it secret because the last thing you want to do is attract competition. The last thing you want to do is attract competition because if you do, especially if you're the least efficient producer out there, you may be out of the game. Uh, this is the scenario. This would be the um, where Will was. I actually exact numbers. Where Will was, his cost was 275, and he's only making 25 cents profit per bushel. He was only making $75 profit before Jordan came along, but then once Jordan came along, if he stayed in the game, he'd be losing $60. So then he's got to ask himself, is things going to improve? If not, I need to get out of the game. Right? Yes. Didn't you say though? Yes, and efficiency helps. And it really comes down to the best you can do as far as being getting that hitting that profit maximizing point. That level of efficiency is going to bring you the most profit you can, but you still have to keep an eye on lowering your costs. Um, Um, remember this curve? Anything you can do to lower that, make it lower still. Make it lower still so you can get that much more profit, that much more profit, that much more profit. You always are going to be shooting to try to lower your costs anyway, which is efficiency. You're not going to be aiming for it. Based on where I am, what is the most efficient point based on where I am, you're going to be looking at what can I do to lower my costs to some level of new reality that will make me more efficient in the long run, not just for today. Good question. So, ultimately, businesses do not like it when new businesses Businesses don't like it when new businesses come into in their playground. Guys, y'all don't like it when somewhere after some other guy starts. New kid moved into the school, new guy moved into the school, starts talking to you lady. Am I right? Y'all don't like that. There again, slashing tires, keying cars, that kind of stuff happens, right? You don't like 
new business. So if you don't want the new competition, keep your profit quiet, keep it secret. And be just so amazing that it don't matter what the new guy looks like, she ain't leaving him. Right? So be amazing to each other. Any questions? So that's your more basic speech for today. Be amazing to each other. There we go. Yes. Any questions? Okay. We will look at barriers to entry to round out this chapter, whatever that day is, Tuesday. Um, have an interesting weekend.